Welcome, folks, to the Squeaky Wheel. Thank you, as always, for listening in. For those of us, for those of you who are watching on video, thank you for um, participating. Thank you always to our subscribers and the many people out there who are helping keep our show going and bringing a lot of attention and awareness to this Indigenous conversation and specifically the Métis conversation. I'm Ross Memphis Pamber, and I'm the co host of the Squeaky Wheel. And with me, as always, my friend, the President. Lawrence Gervais. Lawrence, tell us about yourself. Hello, everyone. I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, being patient. I know Ross was on a little bit of a vacay in uh, BC, and then we had <laughs> Regan, and then he, and then, uh, of course, we had a bit of uh, a time away because our, our editor went on his vacation. So I want to welcome everybody uh, kind of back and look forward to the conversation today with Matt Hilterman. I think at this time of uh, COVID, there's a bit of flexibility when it comes to the listeners in order to uh, recognize the fact that as we're all moving forward through this very complicated journey and with the back to school, yeah, I think there's a fair bit of patience as we're all just trying to figure out how do we find in a few minutes of our time in order to, um, you know, participate. Now, Lawrence, last week you and I talked about proroguing parliament. We talked about... um, kids trying to go back to school and then we had brought in Regan Bartell who's the the medical director for the Métis Nation and she's a registered nurse and has a long tenure of um, experience when it comes to in this last five six months being engaged Um, when we talked about going back to school now it's been a couple well been a week for a lot of folks how do you feel like things are moving well, I'm sure it's been a long week for the ones who went to school and got infected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, very good point. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, you know, what the premier said, it was inevitable that people, you know, might come in contact, and like he said, that was that's basically what happened. And you know, it's not as bad as Quebec and Ontario, but it's it's significant, and I'm sure parents are kind of feeling that anxiety now. Uh, I'm sure, and even the students and the teachers, right? So. It's just a hard thing to adjust to. This virus is not going away. Um, no. We're learning about what Donald Trump was saying in the past in February was was uh, kind of downplaying it, and that's that's his own words, you know. And he didn't want to yeah. create this panic around the virus, and and uh, but then you know you do that over and over and over again. Um, yeah, people are getting infected, and you're still downplaying it. It becomes a bit of an issue, right? So it's just the way it is. Yeah, I agree the, the at the, at the first, when these things were all kicking off and not everybody had a mask at home, I think as we were trying to monitor the situation, you can create a lot of panic. If you, if you are sharing information that you don't know the answers to. So, um, I think we're still in this phase and every time we reintroduce something new, there's a definite new distinct challenge about it. Yeah. Well, you know, the studies we, we, we always hear that it wasn't airborne until just about a month ago. Yeah. But then, you know, Donald Trump knew that in February, that it was an airborne illness and it was making people sick at a right, very rapid rate, right? So yeah. it's, it's very interesting because he was kind of notified by his scientists, uh, the actual virus itself. And we were slowly learning it as we go along. And we're not American, but they definitely have influence up here on people, especially uh, I agree. with masks. Yeah, they definitely have an influence on all of this kind of stuff. Um, so Lawrence, just to bring our li- listeners up to date, as we, we often do, um, the, uh, the folks, the format that we typically follow is I'm going to bring in a little bit conf- com- uh, conversation about some coffee. Oh, and I guess in last week, just to throw out a little shout out, I think it was, um, we were drinking the one from the, um, the Okanagan, wonderful, wonderful wine or, um, <laughs> wonderful coffee. <laughs> and, um. So we'll talk a little bit about coffee, some of the current issues, Métis connections and community. And today our Métis connections, as you mentioned, is going to be Matt uh, Matthew Hilterman, who has a long tenure in the Métis historian world. And as I know you probably have a little surprise for our listeners regarding, um, you know, some of the name information on things that we're developing. Um I'm going to be excited for you to share that information. And then, folks, we talk a little bit about um, what to expect on our future broadcasts. And then Lawrence and I always have a little bit of a rant. So we've talked about uh, what was happening last week. The current issue, Lawrence, of supporting social issues and some of the challenges 
um, without connection and referencing, we talked a little bit about racism recently, but I know you and I were having a small conversation earlier about the distinct challenges, for example, with John A. McDonald. When it comes to the connections that are happening, I know this is Pride Week. This is, um, we're still challenged with uh, how people are understanding and our approaches to the conversation regarding Black Lives Matter and the relationships within all of these communities, including the Indigenous communities. How do we continue to support social connection? Well, you know, Métis has always tried, you know, even our ancestors have always been practicing recognition, 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 and it's for a reason, right? And, and because we want to be listened to. We're a community that uh, definitely has uh, historical information on, on the way Canada was was developed that, uh, you know, it's kind of been lost in some of the teachings that go on in school. And, and um, <clears throat> but, you know, we do have that information, but we also have as citizens in, in most urban centers, because that's where we, we kind of are. We're not confined to reserves. We're, a lot of us live in the cities. Uh, we do have a, a, how you'd say, a viewpoint, a generational viewpoint, too, in some of these uh, locals. And, and uh, the problems that happen in social, economic, and, and all those issues that happen, especially in the Métis community, and the poverty level being, you know, fairly, fairly high. Um, First Nations, of course, is number one in the province. We're, we're definitely number two. Um, and I think the last study they did was about 27% uh, First Nations live in party. We're, we're about 24, and the normal rate is about 11 or 12, right? So we're definitely up there in terms of that. And the reasoning is because of the uh, sort of intergenerational trauma that even happened for the last 150 years, uh, the displacement of our, our families, uh, the identity issues that, that's happened in the Métis community. Um, and we're slowly, as a Métis nation, trying to rebuild all that. Um, but at the same time, educating folks about what that actually is and impacts in the Métis community. But we definitely do have a voice. Uh, there's, you know, the, the gay and lesbian community, um, LGBTQ+, um, plus have a yeah. viewpoint in, in our community. And even we have, uh, you know, interracial marriages with our Black community, too, and we have that that's ready available for people to converse about and talk to the Métis and sort of get their viewpoint. Um, and yeah, the, the issue with John A. McDonald, you know, will be an ongoing thing. I think that it won't happen for, you know, it won't be a complete remediation of what we think happened with, with John A. McDonald's sort of national policies, um, like SCRIP and residential schools and, and all these things and these impacts to displace the Métis, number one. Uh, through using government policy to do that. And mm-hmm. he did the same thing for First Nations, even with the treaty processes too. Um, for us to go, well, John A. McDonald and, and side with the Conservative Party, the viewpoint that he was a significant historical um, founder of Canada, and he was, we're not arguing against that, but so was Louis Riel, right? Right. So if you're going to recognize John A. McDonald as one contributor, well, then you should really recognize the other, right? Yeah. And, um, and also knowing what those impacts did when they were building that railway across Canada. It wasn't about the fight with uh, the, the rail companies. It was the government sort of the way they did their business and the way they implemented things and starving and, and all that other stuff. It was just as a result. And it created a lot of hostility back in 1885. And it created those battles in Saskatchewan too, right? And Canada was kind of responsible for that. So, you know, until they start to take ownership of it and understand that history, the Métis will always continue telling it. And I think that's actually um, hitting the nail on the head right there, is that we need the avenues to share the conversation and share um, an intelligent conversation. Because there's going to be people who who question things that you and I say on this podcast. But ultimately... If you have a question, folks, well, we've always said you can email us and we would love to continue the conversation. It's not necessarily always on air, but we're creating an opportunity right now where we're having a voice and sharing that message. My concern to the people who are just um, reacting and tearing down statues, they definitely have an opinion. And I guess their opinion was that they're tearing down a statue. But folks, I think that 
that's not a positive engaging conversation it's no. very reactionary so so you you know my viewpoint and my opinion is don't tear them down but tell the story of that person sitting there that's right that's what we need as a community uh once you tear them down and you change the names it's you know we it, it just it's just not uh a, a very conducive environment to actually tell anything when the history is gone completely. So. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Mr. Matthew Hilterman, welcome to the squeaky wheel. How's it going? Absolutely fantastic. We've had a, uh, uh, Lawrence and I always get a chance to start the conversations. And today we've been having some, um, in our current issue, we always talk about, um, in this case, we're having a conversation about some of the social issues and and how, you know, the role of culture in, and that violence is not the answer, but how we can bring it in. But with you, we wanted to bring in the topic of Métis historian and your awareness and the culture behind it and, and our appreciation of the fact that you're willing to come onto the squeaky wheel today and share that, uh, that conversation. Cause I've read a lot of the stuff that you've worked on. So the way Lawrence and I often try to engage in these kind of conversations, especially with the people who join the squeaky wheel and the understanding that we have a lot of you know, subscribers and people who are enjoying our conversation and sharing their message with us is before we get too far into anything, Matthew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sounds good. Uh, so, uh, as they've said, my name's Matt Hilterman. Um, I'm born in Edmonton, raised in Calgary, um, so definitely an Alberta boy. Um, my uh, Métis family are the Pruden family. Uh, my grandma's originally from the Fairview, Alberta area, but her family came from, uh, west from Selkirk before that. Um, in terms of uh, my life, I am a... Um, I would describe myself as a public historian. I don't like calling myself a historian because I technically don't have like a PhD yet. Okay. Someday, someday, we'll get there. But um, it's really the only way I think adequately describes what I do for work because most of my work really revolves around uh, researching and um, studying Métis history and historiography, uh, which for those who don't know, that's like the history of history. Uh, it's the meta history, if you will. Wait, sorry, run that one by me one more time, just just because I need that as well. Sorry. Historiography. Ah, okay. The history of history, a sort of meta meta history. So yeah. it's looking not just at the primary accounts and creating a narrative about them, but looking at all the narratives that have been constructed and how they're constructed, uh, and you know what that can reveal. So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I do. Uh, I got started in this field kind of by accident when I was like in high school. Um, growing up, we always kind of knew we were Métis, but like didn't really have any context for it, or at least I didn't. Um, probably until I started working at Heritage Park in grade 11. Um, and I started reading like the site binder and researching the, the site. Uh, and I was like my first impression was there's a lot of really familiar names in uh in this site binder like names in my family tree yeah uh so that that's what kind of got me interested in digging into the history a bit more and um yeah i went pretty deep down that rabbit hole uh so i've been working in public history uh at various museums and heritage sites uh heritage park fort edmonton park Lougheed house um uh, fort calgary most recently also done a bit of work um, with the Edmonton City as a Museum project and um, did a little bit actually out at, uh, by Smoky Lake uh, with Métis Crossing and Victoria Settlement back in 2018. So been around the block, uh, but yeah, my, um, my personal like interest in the subject and my professional life have kind of become the same thing. There is no work-life balance. There's a... Um... There's a narrative that I think Lawrence and I see a lot in our guests that we talk to who their backgrounds. And um, I'm often, I'm, I'm careful in how I approach the question, but with you and a little bit of knowledge of your background, and there's definitely a comfort in it, 
it's not hard for me to say that you have a strong Métis background and, and, I, and, and identity. And I see definitely that you've picked up on uh, your interest within the culture and the direction that it's headed. Is there a spot where that personal journey began? Was it a family member? Was it, I saw you explained both the names, but was there something there? Because for people of the generations that are a little older than, well, let's say Lawrence, because I think I like to think I'm much, much younger than Lawrence, but those generations, no, that's not necessarily true folks, but the, those generations before us, they weren't ever comfortable bringing up the conversation of being Métis, but for, for the younger generation, it seems to be coming out, but was there a spot where that personal journey and that, and that has helped steer you? Um, yeah. So, uh, there's a few aspects. Everything kind of came together that first summer, 2008 okay. at Heritage Park. That's when kind of everything clicked and the light bulb went off <laughs> nice. or on as the case might be. Um, Growing up, like, my mom was a hobby genealogist, and, like, she'd always, you know, she'd be like, yeah, you guys are Métis, and, like, tell us, but, like, we're kids. We don't really care, right? Sure. Um, so I guess it wasn't really until I was in a, what, to me, really was a Métis environment um, that I was like, oh, I, I fit. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I think one of the first times with that was actually at a Region 3 event. Um, Melissa St. Godard was in town doing a fiddle show. Uh, and it was my first time going to a community event and, and, uh, I don't know, it just felt like right at home, right off the bat. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and th- like I said, this is all happening in 2008, that same year I'm starting at Heritage Park and I'm reading, um, you know, about the fur trade history and I'm like, wait, pretty much every name in my family tree shows up here. <laughs> what? Um, and you know, so I was like, that kind of got me more interested in my own family um and the more i dug the more i realized like how deeply rooted we were in red river um but also there is what you were saying about older generations there's a lot of truth to that i once asked one of my grandma's brothers why they never talked about it and he said uh believe his exact words were it was bad enough we were catholic that back then if they didn't wear (laughs) half okay yeah Yeah. (laughs) um so we just didn't talk about it he says Yeah. yeah uh and yeah, so I think it, there was a degree of rediscovery of like, like I knew I was Métis, but I didn't know what that mean, meant. So definitely starting with that job at Heritage Park and the questions I started asking about my family uh, really brought me into understanding what that word, you know, my mom threw around when we were kids meant. Now, I'm going to lead you a little bit because I want to ask Lawrence a question. Lawrence... I need you to touch on a little bit because this is going to bring this right back around to you, Matt. Um, Lawrence, can you talk a little bit about our relationship with Fort Calgary and how that works in? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been gathering at that place uh, where the Old North Trail kind of ends for for years, right? And Hudson's Bay Company Fort was there at one time and on the Inglewood side when there was nothing on the other side because that was pretty much owned by... um, I guess the, uh, the uh, I think it was a land grant to CPR. I'm not sure, but there was nothing downtown, um, but everything was kind of in Inglewood. And, you know, it, it took a lot of our our past leaders like Marlene and Ephraim to really, to go, well, this is our community. This is uh, um, our historical community and really set up the basis for an MOU that happened, I guess, in, in early uh I do believe it was around 2009, I'm not sure. No, 2012, sorry. And Fort Calgary and Métis Nation have always worked together since side by side to really talk about the story that was there and that it was predominantly a Northwest Mounted Police Museum for a long time, moving into where it is now. And now they're talking about First Nation exhibits and Métis exhibits and and having advisory councils with Métis Nation reps to sit on it and and really talking about that gathering location of the Bow and, and Elbow River and the, the significant uh, place that is, especially for Southern Alberta. And Matt, let's talk a little bit about your experience down at Fort Calgary, because you have a bit of a tenure down there now as well. Um, I'm not currently employed by them because COVID. Okay. Um, but I have still been working with them on a few projects, um, namely the, the Complex Stories podcast series I did a, an episode for um on just like 
media identity and its role in shaping Calgary. Um, I'm still like in touch with a lot of my colleagues from there. Um, honestly, in terms of both openness to new ideas and willingness to integrate uh, Indigenous content generally and Métis content specifically, I have to say that they're probably the uh, best workplace I've been at in that regard. Ah. Uh, they're super open to new ideas, to adjusting narratives and to uh, and updating them and to um, sort of talking about like subjects that might be a little more complicated or nuanced or difficult uh, than a lot of other places I've worked. So, um, and I bring that up because they were the first place to like really use my interest in research um, to help develop programming on a, on a bigger scale and develop resources. Now that's not to say I've never done it before. I did it a bit um, at Fort Edmonton uh, and M&A, but um, when I was at Fort Calgary, I had like constantly, I was doing some kind of research project or writing project. And I think it really, it was a great place to come in my, into my own in that. So very now, much love for Fort Calgary. Well, you had I, involvement with the Trickster Trader exhibit in early March. Yeah. That was a, that was a little bit. Time. That was mostly Marlene and Troy. I don't want to take too much credit for that. <laughs> um, I, at most, I did a bit of proofreading. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you're still involved, right? So, yeah. And don't, and, and never discredit that proofreading because honestly, the individuals, especially the meta historians, as you'd sort of somewhat refer to yourself, who are able to put that patient uh, time and effort in order to review, honestly, it is a strong, valuable skill because it's, you know, it's, it's easy for everybody else to just catch the, the highlights, but to find somebody, and I've read a lot of your work, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the cabin um um, presentation that you can find on Fort Calgary, which folks, I highly recommend it. Uh, the CEO is a friend of mine, Naomi had sent it over a copy of it as well past to look at. It is fantastic. Where did that passion come from? Why'd you choose that? Um, well, okay. So I started digging into the hunt house and Métis cabin at Fort Calgary. Cause these are two of the oldest buildings in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I started there, while there was a strong desire, uh, among the people at Fort Calgary to uh, develop programming around it. We didn't really have any materials. Um, we had a box of various research projects that had been done on it, but no one had really uh, aggregated and streamlined that info. Um, and I don't know if they were planning to do it or not, but uh, um, I should actually back this up a sec. So I've been interested in Métis architecture for quite a while. Mm. Um, and like when I first started working at Fort Calgary and saw them, I was like, those aren't just Métis buildings. Those are specifically Yverneau or winter cabins. The architectural style that Métis on the, uh, the, the plains would use is different than, uh, they would along the North Saskatchewan or at Red River. Um, they would use smaller logs and the buildings themselves would be quite a bit smaller too, mostly because there's less wood on the prairies than there is in the parkland and, um, around Red River, but also because, um, you know, these were temporary dwellings in nature compared to like the more permanent structures. Uh, but anyways, it's been an interest of mine for a long time. And so when I saw this, I basically like started doing research on my own and like just out of interest. They're like, you know, we could use some of this material. We, you want some extra hours? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's basically how that came about. But I really wanted to know, like, I wanted to know who was John Bunn? Who were the people living here? Who were the Russells? Who built these houses? And that that question, unfortunately, I don't think, um, unless there's some obscure Mountie journal that I haven't read, uh, we're ever going to have a true answer for. Um, the pool of candidates is pretty small, maybe half a dozen people. But that's still, like, there's still nothing to indicate who it was. Um, yeah, so I just kind of went through the box uh, that of previous researchers reports on, on uh, the Hunt House, Métis Cabin, and some other uh, materials that have been done, uh, archeological r records from Fort Calgary excavation, et cetera. Uh, and I tried to kind of draw together all the different and sometimes conflicting accounts 
um, in these di different sources to give people a clear sense of like, who was it probably, what, you know, what does one account say, what some of the issues with um, why, like a, a good part or big part of that is dedicated to like three likely candidates who are identified over and over again in that font. And um, all three of them, like if you look at other accounts, they, they, they become problematic. <laughs> Uh, so we really don't know who built them, but I think that's kind of part of the um, the intrigue to it. And I think in a way that lets us kind of celebrate the buildings as a community space, because we don't know who built them, but we know whoever built it was Métis. I like um, the way that, that your presentation comes off online, because absolutely, it's intriguing, and you're left with a bit of a who done it When you... You know, if, if the information was right there, now, folks, I don't want anybody to go around to local trees and start writing their names on them. But if, if that had been inscribed at some point, it might have made it easier. But at the end of the day, it's part of history. It's part of that awareness. I know Lawrence wanted to talk a little bit, too, about Lawrence. I sort of alluded to the um, our minutes often. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that direction because I'm excited and I know we've shared some of that information in the past with people um, yeah. and that's what's getting out to the schools, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that and give that awareness to Demat. Yeah. I mean, we've had, you know, a few months to really sort of think and, and plan around uh, these little history vignettes that we're going to produce here at region three. And uh, you know, obviously the prime focus will be on Southern Alberta, uh, you know, historical people to places to, you know, events that that has happened down here um and to really focus on the past and, and what the footprint actually looks like and and uh supporting of course our our provincial and our national uh metis nation of course and uh possibly doing their stories too and how we're going to actually unleash it and the, the name we, we kind of come up was muskrat tales and t-a-l-e-s so it is a bit of a play on words but it actually does focus on that that little um, thing that we used to capture and make furs out of it and, and uh, especially hats, uh, especially for the RCMP, they still use muskrat fur on their hats, right? So, um, but the, the muskrat and what that actually means to us too and that their significant footprint around the Western Canada. And then, you know, what we're going to probably do is three to five minute little short videos on each Métis subject, which of course there's hundreds of them and then host them probably on Patreon and, and, probably ask people for a membership and had different membership tiers for um, everybody that that's here and, and people. So we're going to unleash it in the future. And Matt is helping us with the content, which is fantastic um, that uh, he's able to do that for us. And we look forward to these little filming, these little things and, and um, hopefully get to the schools and our government and, and industry and they start to look at it all too. So the um, yeah. So Matt, that was, um, I know we talked a little bit about it, but I want to say thank you because I've done a bit of the reading that you've provided in some of your other products. And this is a little bit of a sneak preview folks, but on the muskrat tail that uh, Lawrence and I are working on. And thank you again, Matt, for the, for the research, we're going to be talking about pemmican and the, one of the food sources that to me has become, or would almost be historically like be one of the earliest grab and go bar in order to try and keep yourself going. But I wanted to say thank you for that. And I'm excited to have this opportunity to continue to work with you when it comes to that. And Muskrat Tales, yeah, it's going to be something fun. And it's those short vignettes. And our goal, as Lawrence was sort of trying to indicate, is to try and get them on to the schools, those kind of platforms where um, anybody who just needs a few seconds to try and get a little better understanding about a culture, they can start through all of those things. But when it comes to your approach, because you you have a bit of a history um, where do you start when it comes? Cause we're, we're, um, when, when you're going to choose a product that you want to work on, um, do you, do you immediately focus on what was the role of the Métis? Do you immediately focus on what's the value of the information or how do you choose, um, what you, what, where your priority stands or is it everything? Do you grab everything? Uh, I would definitely say I grab everything. Um, usually when I'm researching a a topic. Uh, I like to kind of keep notes that 
are tangential to the specific topic I'm looking for, but might relate to future research. Um, which is how I pulled the, get together the Pemmican ah. script over, you know, only a weekend was because like, you know, I had like these little tabs that talk about various things that were not <laughs> what I was looking at, but are, um, you know, potentially useful for stuff like this. Um, but like my, my approach to history is very much trying to get a, a holistic picture of it. Um, so a big part of that, I should back up a moment. Um, although professionally I've mostly worked in museum and heritage, my academic background is actually in anthropology. Oh, okay. uh, and I do approach uh, history with a bit of an anthropological lens in that um, I really try to be um, descriptive rather than prescriptive in terms of what I see. Uh, like I'm not going in with like a, an idea that this is how it is. I'm going in with more of a, how is this uh, frame of mind? Yeah. Uh, and I like to consult as many sources on a subject as I can, um, which leads to some hilarious situations in the past uh, where like my bibliography is almost as long as my paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But again, I, I don't go in with any presumption that I, I have the answer or that even what I think I know is necessarily right. I kind of go in with the assumption that I could be wrong about what I think I know and let's see what the, um, the, the data says, um, which has actually led me to um, some pretty interesting findings uh, relating to, um, like for example, I never would have guessed before I went through the 1881 census that Calgary was predominantly Métis in 1881. Um, like I expected when I did my similar research for Edmonton and the surrounding area, I expected that because it, it's a fur trade hub, right? Right. Um, not so with Calgary. So I was expecting it to be predominantly European uh, and it wasn't. In fact, the percentage was higher uh, in Calgary than it was in Edmonton. Um, but the reason I bring that up is like, I, I might have that expectation, but at the end of the day, I'm going to like try and get the hard data before I really um, voice that as fact, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. as this case proves, I can be wrong. Um, and that's why it's important to be really thorough and be uh, able and open to revise your or reformulate your uh, hypotheses uh, as new data comes out. So it's really, um, it's almost like a scientific method, you know, hypothesize, check, revise, retest. Um, but unfortunately, unlike science, you can't just set up an experiment. So you kind of have to rely on the re records that exist, yeah. both primary and secondary. Um, and there have been a lot of different uh, approaches to Métis history and historiography. But one that I really like uh, is what Lyle Dick calls the Red River historiographical uh, tradition, which rather than trying to create one um, universal narrative, it draws on threads from different accounts mm -hmm. and like tries to highlight the similarities and differences to sort of construct the narrative through consensus rather than, um, you know, heavily relying on one particular account well and i i guess that's this when it comes to history and this is not mathematical history um it's not as easy to prove and as you said yeah you have to kind of put that together well um thank you for i'm excited for the opportunity and the education you're going to provide to us thank you for the time on the squeaky wheel the um, I look forward to folks. I highly recommend you go to Fort Calgary and we'll try and create some links on our site as well and, and through our social media. And folks, if you have any questions regarding this, uh, always out to TSW at Métis3.org. Lawrence, you close out our time with uh, with Matthew. Yeah, uh, I want to thank Matt for uh, being on here. Um, I know uh, this is his, I guess, second week of providing us at least some information at Region 3 and we look forward to more and... and um, we know spots are going to be opening up and, uh, you know, and we're going to be looking at more, more, more and more contributors to what the history is. And, and uh, you know, I've had a lengthy discussion with Monique Riel and, 
and um, her family history and, and what she does too. And, and Matt, uh, we're just getting to know him. And so far we see nothing but good things. And, <laughs> um, especially yeah. last year, the uh, first time I'm meeting Matt was at the Law Heat House and, and the uh, exhibit that he helped uh, coordinate there. And it was a fantastic showing at, in the Beltline. And, and especially, I'm sure, for the Law Heats, they benefited from that too. So um, yeah. I think everyone's grateful for the things he's progressing to do. And he's fairly young. He has a lot of years ahead of him. And, and um, not even 30. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But imagine him at uh, 60 years old knowing history, right? Um, he'll yeah. definitely be an asset to the Métis Nation. So I want to thank everybody and thank uh, Matt for sure. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a blast. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on the program, Matt. Yeah. Best wishes. Oh, Lawrence, what a what a delightful young fella. His, his, his uh, presentations, his awareness... I love the reading that he puts out. And again, folks, I can't speak highly enough about if going to the Fort Calgary site in order to get a little bit of information. Um, they're doing such a great job of helping us spread the message as well as creating more um, uh, the information of what we're trying to share. They're, they're creating social channels for us regarding the squeaky wheel. Now I'm also excited to start sharing with them the muskrat tales where we're giving these vignettes and that we're going to start getting that a little bit further out into yeah. the information. So no, we're very lucky. Thank you for, for, um, inviting me every time. Like I, I remember when we were at the law heat house and I got a chance to meet Matt the first time and we went to the, the, the traders and the tricksters at Fort Calgary and, and Naomi was generous enough to the, the CEO of Fort Calgary to introduce us to some of the players behind the scenes and creating more of that awareness. Yeah. That um, one was done by Monty Creel. At the, oh, uh, right. Sorry. Matt was there. Um, yeah. that's right. And, um, and actually he was even wearing a costume when he was down there. So he's, <laughs> he's involved and he's engaged. And yeah. I see you're wearing a Martin guitar costume, which is yeah, that's right. <laughs> one of the ones that's behind you. The, oh, this is my shout out. And I apologize uh, to all of our listeners. This was supposed to happen earlier. I'm drink, we're drinking Stoke roasted coffee from the Revel Stoke. So I apologize for that. Um, that usually comes out early. So even I broke format finally, um, we're very, we're getting wonderful guests and it, and I see nothing but repeat of that when people, the narrative, and again, I throw that word out there when they get a better understanding or personal desire to research Métis, a lot of information comes out and they share it with us. We're very lucky Lawrence that you go to as many events Occasionally, you're so generous to bring me along. And folks, we will get to the point where we go back to events again. I, I promise you. But it's going to be a bit of a struggle. How, what should we be looking for in, within our community right now? Within the framework of we are locked down. Are we should be asking our elders to write more of the stories to, so that we can share them? Um. Yeah, I mean, definitely being knowledgeable and you know we 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 practice protocol when we seek an elder for advice no matter what mm. um we prepare try to prepare them as much as possible days ahead before we go there so they're giving us sort of accurate detailed information and then we verify that uh, later on once we get that sort of uh, capture of what uh, they're they're speaking about um and some of them are very have differing viewpoints too so there's always that dichotomy you kind of work with and and how they are raised, right? Because some are raised without knowledge of being Métis or told they're French or they're told that you don't speak your language outside this house because there's a fear that you might be taken away, right? And yeah. that's always the issue, right? Um, the 60s scoop wasn't that long ago. Uh, the residential school system wasn't that long ago, you know, went all the way into the 90s. And there was always that feeling that if you recognize yourself as an Indigenous person, then there would be some consequence to that. That, that was the exact word I was going to say. Yeah, there's a, almost a consequence. that's not the case anymore. So we're very careful on how elders speak, um, but we're always there to listen, number one. That's always important. Um, yeah. We're not there to coerce them into their story, into the narrative. We're just asking them what their experiences were like. Right? So and I think, um, and by having those, the seniors who are sharing that message, it seems as though it's getting easier for the youth to accept, um, you know, 
and, and recognize and celebrate their Indigenous culture, their Métis background, and because everybody else is talking about it, they're more comfortable talking about it. Yeah, that's right. I so. mean, we, we, we're still trying to uncover what we know, you know, and First Nations are, are, are doing the same, right? And, yeah, um, you know, they, they gather a lot more, which is what you want. You know, that's what we want, too, as Métis Nation is yeah. to, to gather and start promoting what our culture is. And, and we know it's a, it's a very complex one and it, through our, our identity, right? And, yeah. and having Métis members come and witness it and then they become a part of it. Um, just like if I go to a powwow, I feel the same way. Like, yeah, my, my grandmother used to speak a different language and it was attached to this community. So I want to learn that community's footprint, right? And what they, they go through and, and powwow or, or all that stuff is always the first step. And like our dances and, and our jigging festivals, it's always the same thing, right? It's yeah our culture that we're promoting. Yeah, and promote that culture forward. So the, yeah, so big shout out folks to, for the groups that are engaging us. Um, make sure you in, um, join us on YouTube. We're looking at a few other avenues. Make sure you subscribe to us, folks. Make sure you just log into YouTube, which is I think the same as your Gmail address, and you can just go ahead and subscribe. To rant today, Lawrence, we talked a little bit about the um, Sir John and McDonald and some of the challenges and the statues and things like that. My rant that I just wanted to bring up with the folks today is, you cannot turn on the TV and not see the American president. And there's always conversation at every day about the American politics. Folks, I want you also to have conversation about Canadian politics and the election that's coming forward. It's harder, I find, to turn the TV on with satellite, with different in internet providers and things like that. It seems like everywhere you turn, there's conversation about Métis, or about the American politics. There's probably enough issues when it comes to Métis politics as well. But the um, but I, folks, my rant is I want you to also focus and use your opportunity to vote. Lawrence, to you. Yeah, um, you know, I, I won't comment too much on, you know, I go on LinkedIn and it's very pro-Trump and then I go on Facebook and it's very anti-Trump and <laughs> I just sit there and go, well, I'm a Canadian. Doesn't matter yeah. to me, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, just, I, you know, I just hope that the attitudes up here in Canada don't become sort of Americanized, right? And that's mm. partly to do with a lot of the COVID stuff, right? Um, Good point. You know, we got to take care of our own nation and our own community. Uh we're very proud to be Canadian people. We're just part of the Métis nation, of course, a nation unto itself. But yeah. we got to protect others, you know, the best way we can and be cordial. If there's people of a different viewpoint, doesn't mean we have to um, throw tear gas at them or, you know, no. No. you know, kick them in the legs or, you know, try to, you know, go at their throats. That's not what a Canadian represents. We're right. here as a multicultural uh, nation with differing viewpoints and we need to accept that. Right. And, uh, I do that. Métis nation is very complex too. It, everyone has differing viewpoints and you just kind of listen to what they have to say and, and, uh, don't disagree or agree or form your opinion. You just kind of walk away. Right. And I think you hit the nail right on the head and maybe we get a chance to close it right there. Listen to what they say, folks. You wouldn't be listening to our podcast right now if you didn't want to listen to what Lawrence and I have to say. And again, we try to have conversation around things that can be challenging, but at the end of the day, we're still having that conversation. So I always appreciate uh, your time, Lawrence, when it comes to these conversations. Uh, big shout out again to Matt Hilterman. I guess the better term to say would be... Um, Métis history researcher who's bringing us a lot of information. Um, shout out to my co-host and my friend, as always, the president, Florence Gervais. Thank you to the traditional lands that are occupied by the uh, under the treaty allowance, the first, um, all of our First Nations friends. Thank you to the, um, the Métis settlements. Thank you to our Métis brothers and sisters and families and that, and that sense of connection. Thank you to our elders. Thank you to our Mother Earth in order for the time that uh, she allows us to use this. And I'm always excited, Lawrence, every time that we get a chance to talk and I hope our friends keep the fire burning. So I want to um, say that, folks, again, one more time, please subscribe to us. Lawrence, close us out. Yes, please subscribe. Squeaky Wheel Pod, uh, the podcast. Just hit that subscribe button right there, um, yeah. and you'll be notified as soon as there's a new episode. 
And uh, definitely when I'm excited to start promoting the Pantheon uh, Métis Tail, I'm uh, sorry, Muskrat Tails. I already got the name wrong. <laughs> um, Patreon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Muskrat Tails and uh, looking forward to that uh, system and, and all your feedback. If there's any feedback or questions, please uh, don't hesitate to put a, a subject on the comment on the bottom of this and we'll try to get your answer back. Yeah, we're trying to share the message, folks, that you all are asking us to hear. So we appreciate your time and thank you for participating and listening to us here on the Squeaky Wheel. And all of you, please stay safe. Best wishes. Bye.